Welcome to this video detailing the exposure triangle and settings on your camera that we wouldn't cover at GCSC and normally leave to A level. When using an SLR or bridge camera, or most cameras rather, uh, you'll face with a whole range of controls and settings. The presets you'll normally find on cheap pocket cameras and everything you need from portraits, landscapes, snowscapes, museum settings are all in here and you can just choose the ones you need. On more advanced cameras there'll be a, a button on top which will give you access uh, to aperture, shutter, manual, priority and various other settings. And there's many pieces of information available based upon whatever setting you have to be using at the time so there's a lot to look at. The camera itself though only understands light, it's got no interest in what you want to do. As long as it's not too light or too dark, the camera's happy with what it achieves, and that's what it will take. It may have some ability to focus, of it, and therefore you might come up with a sharp, clear image, but it doesn't mean that image is going to be particularly good. You'll be lucky, perhaps, if you take snapshots and they're outside and they're in the sun, they're sharp and they're well lit, but take your camera inside, things don't work quite so well. So the camera manages light through the exposure triangle settings which is three, shutter, aperture, and ISO. The shutter on the dial here, seen as an S, is a bit like the blinking of an eye. The longer or shorter the eye is open, the more or less light can get into the eye and hit the retina, or in terms of the camera, the sensor. The aperture, denoted here as an A, is a bit like the iris and dilating into the pupil. The more dilated it is, the less dilated it is, the more or less light can get in again to the retina or sensor on the back of the camera. The ISO settings are about sensitivity to light for the sensor itself, making it more or less sensitive. And this is accessed normally via a menu. The shutter and aperture work with each other to balance the amount of light entering. As I said before, the camera wants to get the right amount of light so here it will prioritize one over the other to get that right balance and how you affect one affects the other it does these or you can access these through the buttons on top of your camera and if you wanted the shutter for instance you choose the s on some cameras however that would be tv for time value for aperture you use A, or it might be AV for aperture value. And together they work in what's called priority modes, meaning that if you're in control of the shutter, the camera will look after the aperture. And if you're in control of the aperture, the camera looks after the shutter. So that you only have to think of one thing, and the camera looks after the rest. There is a programmable mode, denoted by the P. This is the same as auto but you have settings that you can change within that. Fully auto, you can't change anything and the camera is totally in charge. And there are good reasons for not letting it be in charge because it will make mistakes. So P is the best mode you want to use if you want programmable. Because when you change a setting, for instance, the ISO, which we'll come to later, that change stays permanent. Finally, we've got the manual mode. You still need to control aperture and shutter, aperture and, shutter and ISO you're in control of these and you have to get them right. The shutter is measured from whole seconds to thousandths of a second and the slower the shutter speed is the more light comes into the camera and creates a blurred image. The faster shutter speed creates a frozen image simply because less light is able to get off of the object into your camera. Aperture is also known as depth of field. This can be set to wide or narrow. The way depth of field works is that light from the sun or any other light source bounces off an object. So in this case, a very simple tree. And in this case, coming through a small narrow opening in the pupil of an eye or the aperture of the camera, it comes through and hits a small area on the back of the camera or eye and it can't get through in any other places. A beam of light hitting the bottom of the tree or anywhere in the middle 
will come and find its own place. And therefore, you'll create an inverted image of that object on the back of your eye or the back of the camera. If the aperture is wide open, you can see through the orange lines that light can land in many different places from the top of that tree. Same as the light from the, middle, the bottom, same as the light from the middle of the tree, and therefore you'll have thousands of overlying images creating a blur. And this tends to affect only the background or foreground of the image and not the actual subject. So it's something you can purposefully use. The aperture is measured in F numbers. And in this macro shot of a small blue flower, we can see how the flower itself, a tiny part of it's in focus where the background is totally blurred. Whereas on the landscape below, the setting has gone the other way and it's sharp. It depends what effect you want. In summary, shutter and aperture counterbalance each other. What you do with one, you need to consider the other. A slow shutter speed lets in lots of light and therefore lots of motion and time. So water from this waterfall appears blurred because it's taken a few seconds for that image to be gathered. But because it's wide open, it's letting lots of light in is to be counterbalanced with a small amount of light from the aperture. So in this case, it's set to narrow, only a little bit of light gets in, and a small narrow aperture keeps the background and foreground sharp. With a fast shutter speed, the camera blinks very quick to let a small amount of light in and therefore captures the frozen in time aspect of this picture. Because it's only letting a little amount of light in, we need a lot more light to balance out the picture. So the aperture needs to be wide. In this case, a wide aperture causes the background to go blurry. Lastly, we need to look at the ISO, and this is to be used sparingly or not at all. It can be used creatively, but if this is the one which causes problems on cheap cameras. On a cheap camera, the camera tries to guess how much light you need. And if you're in a dark room, it will give you a higher ISO so you can continue using your camera. But then you get the after effects of ISO, which we'll look at in a moment, which is to do with graininess. So it's measured in a high or low sensitivity. This is indicated by less sensitive numbers in the hundreds or more sensitive numbers in the thousands. On low, you'll get detail. So it's good for architectural imagery or anything where you want a lot of detail. The greater the sensitivity, the quicker the sensor reacts to light in dark conditions, but the after effect is a grainy image. The point of view of it is if you're in a dark area, I once was in a cave in Greece, I wasn't able to use my flash, but I could take pictures with a high ISO, which gave me relatively sharp images but they were grainy. And sometimes, depending on the make of the camera, the grain can be tried to quite obtrusive. For instance, in this picture of a child. And again, if you're using a cheap point and shoot camera or something on automatic mode all the time, and you, you're in the sun, the bright sunlight will keep the ISO automatically low. But if you go into the shade, it'll automatically go high and you get the grain. That's why you should use P, because you can force the ISO to stay low. It means at some point you might need a tripod. When you're adjusting an image using aperture and shutter, and if you find your picture still not light enough or still too light, then you can use the ISO to give it that extra boost. So in this case, these the plant pot here is slightly too dark and it's been raised up several of those increments until you come up with an acceptable image but it will, as time goes on, especially towards the thousands, create more grain. In summary, use of ISO will affect aperture and shutter. Use aperture and shutter first, and then consider if you need to use ISO beyond that. ISO gives you more control over shutter aperture, but causes grain and noise. So to review these three techniques, depth of field created by aperture, 
A narrow depth of field uses small F numbers, and the F numbers are what you will see on the screen of your camera. A small number, like F2, causes the background to go blurred. That's good because you want your attention on the foreground, the flower or the person. A wide depth of field with a large F number, like F16, the background is sharp. Attention is focused on the subject within the whole landscape. The way to remember this is small number is a small view, large number is a large view. Shutter speed is much simpler to get your head around. A smaller number, like a fraction of a second, one two hundredth, one one thousandth, is a quicker amount of time and it allows a fraction of a second to go by, capture an image that seems to be frozen in time. Whereas a slower shutter speed, the seconds go by and more light comes in and more of the image is captured. In this situation, you need a tripod, otherwise everything will be blurred. On this beach scene, all the woodwork at the side is nice and sharp and so is the beach in the foreground. It's only the sea which is moving that is blurry, but the camera is probably on the tripod or some of the mount. ISO. With a high ISO setting, grain is apparent, it's very obvious. This can be quite nice on the black and white image sometimes, but on colour it can be quite obtrusive. A low ISO setting is what you should be aiming for most of the time because that keeps everything sharp. But sometimes you'll find you might need a tripod. Same as you would with a slow shutter speed. So to summarise how to use these different settings, choose a wide aperture for a blurred background. A narrow aperture for a sharp background. A fast shutter to create a split second image. A slow shutter to create a blurred motion image. A high ISO allows you to take images in darker environments without the need of a tripod, possibly, but they will be grainy. And a low ISO shot will keep everything sharp and at maximum detail, and this is what you should be aiming for most of the time. So we're having a look at this site, www.canonoutsideofauto.ca. This has an inbuilt photo and you can apply all the settings one at a time in whatever order you want to see what the effect would be on the picture. It's worth having a look. So next, look at the following images that come up and see if you can predict what the three settings might be and then justify your own reasoning. Start by describing the most obvious settings, then try to justify the others. For example, if the picture is blurred, is it due to a slow shutter? If the shutter is slow, how much light is it letting in? Therefore, how much would the aperture have to be set to let in the right amount of light to make the image balanced? So first image, look at this one. The most obvious here, I'll say is the ISO. The picture is obviously grainy. The next, you might have to start guessing, but the next, I would say shutter. Not because there's any evidence of a fast shutter speed in the picture, but because it's a child. Children, animals, moving objects of any kind, you're going to need a fast shutter speed. <clears throat> and finally, it leaves the aperture. Because the fast shutter speed, less light is coming in through the shutter, therefore we need more time for light to get in through the aperture. So therefore it will be wide to let more light in. That would make sense. Things tend to work one way in a studio environment, but somehow they're sometimes slightly different outside. This image, I went initially for the aperture because the background is clearly blurred. That means the aperture is wide. And the opposite of a wide aperture is a fast shutter. Fast shutter, less time to let the light in. Aperture's wide, lets lots of light in so they balance each other out. You can also see there's a bit of motion captured here in the small child in the bottom left hand corner in mid climb. So it's not a totally static shot. It's also relatively sharp in its detail. This is a slightly low resolution shot, but I'm pretty sure that the ISO is low to keep as much detail as possible. Knowing this, you can go and take something similar yourself. In this image, the obvious one is the shutter. It's a very fast shutter speed as the movement is frozen. Next, I look for distance detail. It's hard to see with the clouds, but the clouds in the mid distance you can still see, see some sharpest edges as well as on the waves on the horizon. So I think this is a narrow aperture. And the ISO, I say, is low because there's lots of detail in this picture. But there's a problem. Up to now, fast shutter speed has been paired with a wide aperture. 
fast shutter speed lets less light in. Wide aperture lets lots of light in. Here we've got fast shutter speed letting less light in. Narrow aperture letting less light in. Low ISO letting less light in. So what's going on? The obvious answer here is it's outside. Lots of bright weather. Well lit. And all that light is enough to, that these settings can stay quite low and you can get the settings the way you want. So it's different when you're outside in a bright day to when you're inside the studio environment or to when you're just taking casual photographs at home or at a party. Look at this one. A famous photo. I'll start with the obvious one here, the ISO. It's high. The image is grainy. Although this wouldn't have been taken digitally with a high ISO, it would have used a different format years ago called ASA. The film of the camera would have been set to a high ASA. The developing fluids would be set to high ASA and, and the, the paper as well that it's developed on. But the equivalent now is ISO. And so we can say here that this image is displaying a high ISO because it's grainy. Next, let's look at the shutter. For all everything looks a bit blurred, so perhaps that's a slow shutter speed. And to the opposite of a slow shutter speed is a wide aperture. But to me, this doesn't seem right. The splashes in the, the surf where the soldier is in the water. There's lots of action, lots of movement. It wouldn't be slow. What's going on? In reality, this taken by Robert Capra in the D-Day landings. He's running up the beach, not armed with a rifle, just armed with a camera. He can't stop. He will get shot. He has to keep moving. So it needs to be taking a fast shutter speed. And the opposite of a fast shutter speed is a narrow aperture. And a narrow aperture gives you a sharp background. We don't have a sharp background. Everything's a bit blurry. And does this look right for fast shutter speed? But again, we've got bad weather. We've got low light. We've got the camera is set to the equivalent of high ISO. That's going to affect the picture quality. It's going to make it grainy. It's not going to be as sharp. And the logic is he would want the shutter set fast. He would want to be able to see as much as possible of the landscape. So fast shutter speed and a narrow landscape to keep everything as sharp as possible would help that. Also, these images were damaged during development. So they ended up looking a lot worse than they should have done. On this one, the most obvious one would be the smooth looking water. This is the equivalent of blurry streaks of light at night. Imagine traffic going by leaving a streak, a streak of um, tail lights. So the water has been achieved. The slow shutter speed blurred motion. We can tell it's not just a blurry photo because everything else is sharp. The detail on the horizon is sharp. So that suggests a narrow aperture, small aperture, less light getting in, keeps the background sharp. And it's generally detailed, not grainy, low ISO. For the final image, this one's in the studio environment. The ISO is low because it's all sharp, lots of detail. And that would be the aim most of the time to have a low ISO. I'm going for fast shutter speed here, not because there's anything telling me that there is a fast shutter speed. Simply, that's what the ideal would be. You want to be able to take your picture quick, sharp, in control, get as much detail as you can, and a fast shutter speed helps that. And because it's in a studio, you can control the lighting to exactly what you want. And so you can have enough lighting to make this work. So shutter speed can be fast, and then the aperture alongside that would be wide. Depending on how you control the light, of course, you get as, as much light in there as you like. You can set it up exactly as you want, but a wide aperture, which would cause a blurry background in this case, doesn't matter because there is no background. It's just a plain colored backdrop. So to understand how photographers use the exposure triangle, shutter and aperture, as we've said, are connected, especially in the priority modes. ISO can be used to further moderate shutter and aperture setting. So use the aperture and shutter priorities. And if you need to use ISO, keep it set at a small, um, less sensitive number to begin with. And if need be, you can raise it up through those more sensitive numbers, but it might cause after effects of graininess. And each of the different setting produces their own effects again, whether it's graininess from ISO, whether it's blurred motion 
from shutter speed or whether it's a out of focus background through the aperture. So what you could do now is investigate different photographers and look at their images and consider how they've used those three settings. And then think how you yourself can use those as a starting point when you start to take your own images. Good luck. Mm -hmm.